Welcome to Success Weekly with James Tharris, a weekly dose of thought-provoking ideas and helpful tips on improving your mindset. And now, here's your host, James Tharris. Hello and welcome to another episode of Success Weekly. I'm James Tharris, and we have been focusing on a book called Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. Uh, the book was written in 1960, and I've been going through each chapter and just taking out a little blurb or two that I've highlighted through my reading and then discussing that and kind of building upon it. So today we're going to be focusing on, or this week we're going to be focusing on chapter six, which is titled Relax and Let Your Success Mechanism Work For You. And I'm going to jump right to uh, a couple of pages past. There's been, there were some, some highlights here that I'm not going to read here, but uh, there is one I'm going to read to you, and then we're going to kind of build off of this. And that, and, and, and that goes like this. Skill in any performance, whether it be in sports, in playing the piano, in conversation, or in selling merchandise, consists not in painfully and consciously thinking out each action as it is performed, but in relaxing and letting the job do itself through you. Creative performance is spontaneous and natural as opposed to self-conscious and studied. And see, that reminds me a great deal of my competitive days towards the, the middle or the apex, excuse me, toward the apex of my career when I was really on fire as a competitor. I remember, you know, it took me eight years to get to my, to, to, from, from not placing at all to placing fifth place in a group of six people. And then, of course, going up the ranks and getting from third, going from third place to second place and first place and finally to grand champion and kind of staying in the grand champion mode until I retired. Then I came out of retirement to test myself once again back in 2012 and amassed uh, several more grand champion trophies along with a, a bunch of other first place, but also some seconds and thirds and some no places at all. So I, I had all that as well. So it's not once you become a champion, you just stay a champion. You're, it, it took me a lot less time to be a champion, to become a champion the second time than it did the first time because I knew all the mistakes that I made the first time, why it took me so long. It took me a fraction of the time the second time because I'd already had a foundation built that I could, you know, just dust dust things off and fortify and, and you know, I could get the results much quicker. But when I was in the, the apex of my competitive career, when I was performing, uh, especially the solo routines, the forms and, and weapons uh, routines and being judged for those, there got, there, there got to be a point in my, my uh, competitive career where it, it almost seemed like I would step up, I would bow into the judges and take my place on the competitive floor, begin my routine, and just as I did about the second and the third move, I would like spiritually leave my body and go sit down as a spectator and watch me perform my my performance. It actually felt like that. And I, I remember I, I've, I used to teach my students this and I haven't really taught that principle in a long time, but when you get really, really good at something and your adrenaline kicks in, it's kind of like the movie The Matrix and everything slows down around you. You're actually moving a lot faster than what it appears but it, it, to you in that moment, it feels like it's very slow. And if you do it long enough and, and hard enough, you know, with, with a, enough emotion behind it, then you have that other experience of stepping back and it's, it's like you're watching yourself from a third party perspective. And that's what this is basically saying. So let me read this again now that I've told you a little bit about the, how, how that relates to, to my personal experience. And it says, skill in any performance, whether it be in sports, in playing the piano, in conversation, or in selling merchandise consists not in painfully and consciously thinking out each action as it is performed, but in relaxing and letting the job do itself through you. Creative performance is spontaneous and natural as opposed to self-conscious and studied. Now, if you turn on the television and you watch a movie where you get drawn in in the first five minutes, you probably have, have had that experience before as well. What typically happens is you believe that character on the screen is real. What you tend to forget in the, in the moment is that the person portraying that character is just a human being that is really not that person that has read a script and memorized it or memorized some of the lines and practiced and rehearsed them so much, so, so frequently, so often that they are able to bring something of into that character that wasn't there before. They're able to convince you that they are that character. 
they are able to emote in a special way and to make you believe that they feel that fear or that pain, that, that anger, that joy, or whatever it is they're portraying on the screen. They're able to make you believe that they are a doctor or an astronaut or a lawyer or a comedian or whatever it is that they're portraying on the screen when they really may not have those skills much at all. Now, when, when an actor goes for a part, obviously they get, the, they get a little experience. So, so again, talking about the movie The Matrix, a good, good example of that was Keanu Reeves. Prior to that movie, Keanu Reeves was not a martial artist. Now, after that movie, he really got interested in the martial arts as a result of acting in this movie but they took a lot of people and Lawrence Fishburne as well who played uh, I can't think of his Neo is, is was uh, uh, the one character uh, Keanu's character I think Morpheus was uh, what what uh, Lawrence Fishburne played well neither one of these guys were martial artists but they trained them very rapidly and for a very short period of time so that they would look at least somewhat believable on screen. And they did a great job of it, by the way. And, and that was one of those movies that really kind of changed the whole face of, of action movies. And now you see it, it's much more common for actors to do their own stunts and to learn martial arts and, 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 learn, and learn, really learn how to fight. And so they, they gain a little bit of this experience and convince us who are watching the movie that they're really that character and they can really do these things right including fight or cook or uh, uh, fly an airplane or whatever it is that they're they're acting out on the movie so they, they've got just enough experience to make you and I believe that their character is real and so that's the point at in their career where they're able to step back third party and, and they can literally do it because they can watch themselves on the movie screen or the television screen afterward and see their character whether it came to life or not and the ones who make the biggest impact on us, the ones that bring the tears or the laughter or the anger or whatever, are the ones who are the best at being in the moment. And not they're not reading a canned script. They don't sound like they're reading a script. I will punch you. No, I'm going to punch you, right? They'd say, they say it differently. And, you know, the... the that like uh, Chuck Norris was was uh, well known for delivering very dry one-liners like that, and so Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, same thing. They weren't considered the greatest of actors, although m both of them really developed their craft. And Jean Claude Van Damme, another martial arts actor that, that kind of fell into that, uh, and Jeff Speakman, I talked about him on a podcast uh, recently as well. These guys weren't known as the best actors, but those who stayed with it, they got better at it. They didn't probably didn't get to the the level that some of the, the A-list actors get to, but nonetheless, they did they did a pretty good job. And and the problem was like for for instance, Jean Claude Van Damme. I remember his movie Kickboxer, when his his brother I think it was Kurt, no Kurt he was Kurt. Uh, I forget his brother's name. Anyway, he got his back broken by this guy named Tom Pole, and uh, then he, of course he had to pretend like he was upset about it at the doctor's office when the doctor told him he wouldn't make him walk again. And I remember Jean Claude delivering a line, "You make you're going to make him walk again." And it was so phony. It was supposed to make you cry, but instead of making us cry, it made us laugh because it was it was phony. It was canned. It wasn't natural, and it was a terrible performance from him in that particular scene. You know, we didn't care about that scene anyway. We just wanted to get to the end where he beats Tom Poe, right? We wanted to see his training sequence and see him win the, the match. That's the acting we wanted to see. So, you know, it, it's the same in everything, though. That, that's my message today with with today's podcast is is that whatever you do you will find that you'll get to a point where it's just natural and that's that should be your goal so as a martial artist the goal is is not to learn a bunch of choreographed routines so you can perform martial arts techniques but so you can actually move like a martial artist there's a big difference between somebody just performing martial arts techniques and somebody who moves like a martial artist and somebody who fights like a martial artist versus somebody who just tries to run some some patterns they learned like a football player that tries to run the button hook pass but can't really you know uh, uh, modify it on the fly and ad lib it where necessary and make that play unique in some way you see that that's the thing to that uh, we have to remember that that's our mission is to try to bring things it's like walking right how many how many uh, thoughts do you have about walking about how to, how to put the other foot in front of the other and when your arms swing how, how much thought do you give to your breathing you probably have a lot of thought on your breathing right now because I'm talking about it but you know 10 minutes from now you're gonna forget all about it and your body's just going to naturally breathe that's what we've got to learn how to do with our mind is naturally gravitate towards success and nav naturally gravitate towards 
thinking successful things about ourselves and doing doing things that make us uncomfortable you've got to get comfortable being uncomfortable right okay now let me let me read another one of these uh, next page here conscious consciously practice the habit of taking no anxious thought for tomorrow by giving all your attention to the present moment again that that's it goes right along right along with that and you, you can't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow you can only worry about what's happening today. So if you've got an IRS, you know, bill coming in for $10,000, you know, what good is that going to do to worry about that for all, all month long, all year long, because you can't pay it. You, you, if you can't pay it right away, all that you can do is, you know, call them up and tell them, hey, I can't pay it, and I'll pay you what I can pay you when I can pay you, and then stop worrying about it. What does that worrying do for you in this in, in this moment? I'll tell you what it does for a lot of people is is financial worry like that affects their performance in the here and now. They can't even enjoy the day because they're focused on this, this money that they owe. And that's why, you know, getting out of debt is such a peaceful, peaceful thing it, it gives brings a lot of peace to people to not have any debt to having financial debt is one of the worst things you can do do for your your subconscious to really you know keep yourself miserable so that's just a, that's kind of a sidebar all right let me go on here uh, look neither forward nor backward beyond a 24-hour cycle live today as best as you can by living today well by living today well you do the most within your power to make tomorrow better all right. Uh, another one. Try to do only one thing at a time. All right. This is an, an age of multitasking. I'm going to do a, a s totally separate podcast on multitasking uh, because it's 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 really not a healthy thing to be doing. But but most people are, and I'm guilty of it as well. Multitasking when we drive. Uh, how many people have seen the the guy drive down the street using his knee, eating a hamburger, talking on the phone, and shaving? You know, at the same time. You know, that may be a little excessive, and and you know. Uh, uh, crazy example but you get the idea right it's better to try to do one thing at a time and do it well than it is to try to do multiple things right and it says we can only do one thing at a time realizing this fully convincing ourselves of this simple and obvious truth enables us to mentally stop trying to do the things that lie next and to concentrate all our awareness all our responsiveness on this one thing we are doing now when we work with this attitude, we are relaxed, we are free from the feelings of hurry and anxiety, and we're able to concentrate and think at our best. Now, from reading that, you'd think that this book was written last week. Remember, this book was written in 1960. So imagine just how much more it applies today than, than it did back in 1960. I think that all of these things, these concepts are like wine, and they get finer with uh, the passing of time, the passage of time. So, so that's, that's our, our kind of thought process for today. Uh, so keep that in mind. Let me let me continue it through this chapter here. There's some couple of little. Uh, actually, you know what? That's the end of this chapter. That's what I. That is what I uh, highlighted. And let's let's go back. Let me go back to the beginning of this here and see if there's anything I missed because I think I did skip one in the beginning. I'll go ahead and come back to it then. So this is chapter six. Okay, here's what I skipped. It says, in order to receive an inspiration or a hunch, the person must. First of all, be intensely interested in, in solving a particular problem or securing a particular answer. He must think about it consciously, gather all the information he can on the subject, consider all the possible courses of action. And above all, he must have a burning desire to solve the problem. But after he has defined the problem, sees in his imagination the desired end result, secured all the information and facts that he can, then additional struggling, fretting and worrying over it won't uh, won't help but they will hinder the solution so it's it's kind of all about being in the moment and I talked about it in a little bit of a, an obscure way when I talked about stepping out of myself and seeing myself third party and the, the, the way that actors do but it, it, you see how these reading a book can give you a connection to something that is totally removed from the original thought in that book but it's very powerful because it allows you to connect the dots and see that, that principle at work in other areas. So that's pretty much all I've got for today. Hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it and let me know in the comments. That's all for this week. Tune in next week for another episode of Success Weekly. Do you have an idea you'd like James to talk about in an upcoming episode? Post your comments and be sure to share this podcast with friends. 